Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our uh, Friday morning virtual program. I uh, hope everybody is doing well. This is Mark Erkin, um, and, uh, and we have put up on the screen um, a, a notice regarding the second of um, three and possible four programs for, on the World Congress on Thyroid Cancer. Um, there is a, a session coming up um, on June 5th, and I want to just call everyone's attention to this. Um, this is really an outstanding forum, and um, I strongly encourage you to, um, uh, to register, and hopefully um, you'll, you'll learn more about this um, uh, by registering to the site, and you can get inside information. Uh, so it's Saturday, June 5th, and um, call everyone's attention to that. Uh, this morning's lecture um, is what we uh, anticipate to be a series of what we're calling primer lectures. Um, these will be unique in that these are really um, some background information uh, for individuals. We realize that um, as, as we have put out our programs for the remainder of 2021, that it would be helpful for us to have a series of lectures um, that gives some more background information on the basics of um, the science that has gone into uh, clinical practice, that has emerged into clinical practice. And so this morning's lecture is by Dr. Jeffrey Crane, um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about him. We do have an up upcoming lecture um, that will even be more basic in um, on molecular diagnostics and um, the evolution of uh, molecular um, uh, um, changes into clinical medicine and therapeutics by uh, Dr. Jane Hausford um, that will be coming up in two weeks. So I call your attention to that. Um, for those of you who would like a little bit more background information, um, Jane's lecture will be, um, I believe, outstanding. Um, and then um, one more thing, a note, um, we will be launching a um, year-long initiative uh, known as TIRO, which is Thyroid International Recommendations Online. Uh, TIRO is a really exciting program um, that uh, we will be talking to you more about probably um, in two weeks. We will be going live with that, um, and that's something that um, I'm extremely excited to present to you. Um, so this morning's lecturer, Dr. Jeffrey Crane, is a professor of pathology um, and the director of cytopathology fellowship program at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Um, Jeff spent 26 years in Boston at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, where he was an associate professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School. His research interests span not only um, thyroid cytopathology, but also um, head and neck, and in particular, salivary cytopathology. Um, he is uh, currently an associate editor of cancer cytopathology and the co-author of uh, the Bethesda System for Reporting Thyroid Cytopathology, an extremely important um, resource for all of us in um, the management of thyroid nodules. And so with this, I would like to turn over the program uh, to him. Um, and encourage all of you to write in your questions, um, and we will do everything we can to address those at the end of his talk. Good morning. My name is Jeff Crane. Uh, this morning I'll be uh, talking to you about genetic mutations uh, in thyroid cancer management, and we'll be discussing uh, their role in the diagnosis and treatment of thyroid cancers. Uh, and this is intended as an introductory uh, lecture to uh, this topic. I'd like to start by thanking Dr. Erkin for inviting me uh, to speak with you here today. So during the next 40 minutes or so, we're going to talk about genetic mutations uh, involved in thyroid cancer. And I hope what you'll come away with include uh, some knowledge of what are the most common mutations associated with thyroid cancers, how these mutations uh, can aid in 
uh, the diagnosis of thyroid cancer, and how our knowledge of these mutations uh, can also have an impact on the treatment of patients with thyroid cancer. I'd like to start our discussion by focusing on uh, the Cancer Gene Atlas Project, the TCGA. This was a study done and published back in 2014, looking at a series of almost 500 papillary carcinomas in an extremely comprehensive manner. The TCGA looked at genomic, RNA, microRNA, proteomic, and DNA methylation analyses uh, of these tumors. And as uh, part of uh, their accomplishments, uh, they recognized a variety of new, previously undiscovered uh, oncogenic driver mutations of papillary carcinoma to the point where uh, they significantly reduced the number of unknown driver mutations uh, associated with papillary carcinomas. Prior to the TCGA, about 25% of all papillary carcinomas had an unknown driver mutation. After the TCGA, that number was below 5%. And of course, this is significant to us because we all can recognize that papillary carcinomas constitute a large percentage of all thyroid malignancies. So by uh, re significantly reducing uh, the number of unknown driver mutations in papillary carcinomas, we're also significantly reducing the number of driver mutations uh, overall in uh, thyroid cancers as a whole. I think one of the most important take-home messages from the TCGA is to recognize that we can separate papillary carcinomas into two broad groups of tumors. Uh, this uh, accomplishment was done by doing gene expression profiling uh, in 71 genes uh, within the TCGA. And, and doing, by doing so, uh, these papillary carcinomas were broadly segregated into two groups of tumors, those that have BRAF-like mutations and those, those that have RAS-like mutations. The BRAF-like family, that is those tumors that have BRAF B600E mutations or, or tumors that have a similar gene expression profile, morphologically comprise a group of tumors that are largely comprised of tall cell variants and classic type, uh, types of papillary carcinomas. The RAS-like family of tumors, again, these are tumors that have RAS point mutations or similar gene expression profiles to those tumors uh, amongst papillary carcinomas are going to be comprised uh, in large part by follicular variants of papillary carcinoma. And we now recognize uh, that these follicular variants of papillary carcinoma and subsequent to this project, uh, the uh, identification of tumors that are now termed as NIFPs, uh, that these tumors from a molecular perspective more closely resemble follicular neoplasms, so follicular adenomas or follicular carcinomas in terms of their underlying molecular uh, alterations that are associated with them. Uh, looking more broadly at molecular alterations in a, in a group of well-differentiated uh, thyroid uh, neoplasms, this is a nice uh, summary from this review article by Drs. Uh, Chu and Sadow. Uh, looking at some of the more common mutations uh, and some of the more well-differentiated thyroid uh, neoplasms that we encounter in practice, so follicular carcinomas, follicular adenomas, classic type papillary carcinomas, infiltrated follicular variants, uh, encapsulated follicular variants of papillary carcinoma, and those NIFPs. If we uh, look at this summary table, Again, here you can see the BRAF V600E mutations and uh, the uh, other uh, uh, genetic alterations that, would we, that we would characterize as falling within the BRAF-like uh, tumors. And you can see that those tumors, uh, those mutations rather, are largely associated with classic type papillary carcinomas and infiltrative follicular variants of papillary carcinoma. In contrast, uh, tumors that have RAS point mutations or have RAS-like mutations, those tumors are going to fall into uh, the 
classification histologically as being tumors that are either follicular adenomas, follicular carcinomas, uh, encapsulated follicular variants of papillary carcinoma with minimal capsular invasion, or those indolent tumors known as NIFPs. Uh, and so, so it's important for us to recognize here uh, that, that particularly with those mutations that are highlighted in blue, uh, that a significant subset of those are going to be associated with tumors that are not malignant, uh, follicular adenomas, completely benign tumors, uh, as well as those indolent tumors, uh, the, the NIFT-Ps, which also, uh, to a large extent, are going to have the, this class uh, of mutations associated with them. So what I hope you can begin to appreciate uh, is that the molecular landscape of, of thyroid uh, neoplasms uh, is complex, and we are going to introduce some, a little bit more complexity as we go along. Uh, but right away, it's an important concept for us to recognize uh, that the mere presence of a mutation does not necessarily uh, equate with the presence of malignancy. And that's particularly true uh, with uh, RAS mutations and, and that RAS family of mutations. Uh, high risk, there are certain high risk mutations, however, uh, that the mere identification of those mutations is likely to portend the presence of a malignancy. Uh, so that would include the BRAF V600E mutation uh, and BRAF family of, of uh, mutations such as re re gene rearrangements, uh, uh, ALK uh, and NTRAC uh, fusions as, as well. So when those mutations are identify, identified, there's a nearly 100% likelihood uh, of of the diagnosis of papillary thyroid carcinoma. Uh, another class of mutations that we would consider to be high risk are TERK promoter mutations, and I'll discuss those uh, more momentarily. Again, those are the high risk mutations, the ones that we can say are very highly associated with malignancy. And then there are those uh, RAS-like mutations that we would put into a lower risk or intermediate risk uh, category uh, because they can sometimes be associated with follicular adenomas or NIFPs, as well as with uh, follicular carcinomas or encapsulated follicular variants of papillary carcinoma. Let's talk briefly about TERT mutations. Uh, TERT stands for telomerase reverse transcriptase. Uh, TERT promoter activating mutations have been identified uh, basically, in any type of uh, follicular-derived carcinoma, they can be seen. Uh, they are more frequently identified uh, with the more aggressive malignancies, so they are more common in poorly differentiated carcinomas or anaplastic carcinomas, but they can also be seen in a smaller subset of papillary carcinomas and follicular carcinomas. And when present, particularly in conjunction with another driver mutation, TERP promoter mutations are associated with more aggressive clinical behavior. This uh, figure uh, exemplifies uh, this change in behavior. Here you can see uh, a comparison uh, in terms of recurrence-free survival uh, in patients who either have uh, neither TERT nor BRAF mutation, patients who have uh, TERT mutation alone uh, patients who have a BRAF mutation alone, or those patients who have a TERT, both a TERT and a BRAF uh, V600E mutation. And you can see that they act uh, synergistically uh, to promote more uh, aggressive clinical behavior in these patients. So that's a significant uh, uh, finding if we can find uh, these uh, in conjunction with one another in terms of potential prognostic information. Now, how does the, our knowledge uh, of the mutational profile of a thyroid neoplasm aid in diagnosis? Uh, you may be surprised to know that for me as a surgical pathologist or a cytopathologist, uh, generally speaking, it's not terribly helpful or, or I don't really need that information to know what the underlying mutational profile is of a thyroid tumor in order to render a diagnosis. For the most part, 
our diagnoses are, are rendered based on what we see under the microscope. So they're morphology based uh, in the vast number of cases, both on the surgical pathology side of things and on the psychology uh, side of things. Uh, we're going to classify things mostly based on what we see under the microscope. Uh, in those challenging cases uh, where we're struggling to make a distinction, say between a medullary carcinoma and a follicularly derived uh, neoplasm, uh, we're going to use ancillary studies like immunohistochemical stains that are largely phenotypically based. So we would say look for calcitonin expression if we're trying to identify a medullary carcinoma versus thyroglobulin expression if we're looking for a follicular derived neoplasm. But the mutations do come into play significantly uh, on the cytology side of things. And that's what I'd like to spend a significant uh, chunk of time uh, discussing going forward. So here's a look at the revised Bethesda system. So this is the most recent update to the Bethesda system. Hopefully this is familiar to all of you. It's a six-tiered scheme. Uh, things I would want to point out right away uh, or are that you know the Bethesda one and two categories are going to uh, be associated uh, with patients who are unlikely to go uh, to surgery uh, and would just be followed clinically or perhaps the Bethesda one category have a repeat uh, FNA as part of their uh, subsequent uh, workup. Uh, the patients who will fall into the Bethesda six category. They're going to have malignant aspirates uh, with a nearly 100% uh, likelihood of malignancy and are typically going to be sent for a surgical referral uh, and, and subsequently have uh, their, their nodules removed. Uh, thinking about the uh, mutation, uh, I, I want to point out a, a significant uh, fact here, and that is that generally speaking, uh, the tumors that fall into the malignant category are going to be tumors that are uh, show clear-cut evidence of papillary carcinoma. And histologically, those are usually going to be classic types of papillary carcinoma or 12-cell variants of papillary carcinoma. And this is largely true in the suspicious for malignancy category as well. So that means uh, that most of the tumors that we're going to see in, the, in, in Bethesda 5 and 6 categories are going to be uh, heavily represented uh, by those BRAF E600E mutated tumors or the BRAF-like uh, tumors. And that's where we're going to, those mutations would lar largely fall within those categories. But those actually aren't going to be the mutations that are usually going to be identified in the so-called indeterminate category, particularly the low-risk indeterminate categories, the Bethesda 3 and 4 lesions. Uh, you're going to see m much fewer of the BRAF-like mutations there and many more uh, of the RAS-like mutations uh, there. And that's because, uh, particularly the Bethesda 4 lesions, those are going to be follicular adenomas and uh, follicular carcinomas to a large extent, also follicular variants of papillary carcinoma and NIFPs. Those are going to be the entities that we, with the majority of Bethesda 3 and 4 uh, lesions ultimately identify, uh, even if they prove to be malignant, they're not going to be uh, the classic type papillary carcinomas in the tall cell variant uh, in most instances. Uh, but those Bethesda 3 and 4 aspirates, you can see the risk of malignancy is actually quite low overall, uh, ranging between 10 and 40%. Uh, so if we sent all of those patients to surgery, uh, we'd be sending a lot of patients uh, with benign nodules unnecessarily uh, to, resec to diagnostic uh, resection. Uh, so this is really the opportunity where we have a significant opportunity to intervene and potentially spare patients uh, from undergoing unnecessary surgery. Uh, the schematic uh, highlights uh, that, that approach and the potential role for molecular testing. Again, benign aspirates are going to have clinical follow-up malignant aspirates, and in most instances, those aspirates that are diagnosed as being suspicious for malignancy are going to get a surgical referral. So if it says the three and four aspirates, the so-called low-risk indeterminates, that's where there's the opportunity to use molecular testing as an intervention to identify those patients who should go for surgical referral and those patients who don't need to and can be followed uh, clinically. <clears throat> 
there's going to then be a smaller subset of patients who you potentially might also want to do molecular testing on. And those are, are, are mostly going to be patients who fall into the suspicious for malignancy category, but perhaps also some patients who have a malignant diagnosis, uh, specifically in the scenario uh, where the knowledge of the underlying molecular alteration would alter the extent of surgery. So if it would de determine, for example, whether you're going to do a lobectomy or a total thyroidectomy, uh, then there may be a role for molecular testing in those Bethesda 5 and Bethesda 6 aspirins. Now, what are the specific molecular tests that we're talking about? Uh, these can be homegrown uh, tests, and those are perfectly viable options. Uh, but in many instances, people use commercially available uh, tests. Uh, and there's really three tests uh, that I'm going to discuss in the remainder uh, of our, our, our talk. Uh, that's the thyroseq test, the Affirma test, and the Thygenx uh, and Thyromere tests. So let's first talk about the thyroseq test uh, because this is probably the most uh, straightforward uh, conceptually. Uh, this is uh, looking for gene mutations and gene rearrangements that would be associated potentially with uh, the presence of a, of a malignancy. Uh, the first iteration of the thyroseq test uh, really only looked at seven genes uh, or, or rearrangements. There were BRAF, uh, the BRAF E600E, uh, RAS point mutations, uh, RET-PTC gene rearrangements, and PAX8 uh, PPAR gamma rearrangements. Uh, but you can see that over a relatively short period in subsequent iterations of the thyroseq test, uh, there was a rapid expansion of the number of gene mutations and rearrangements uh, that the thyroseq test encompassed and looked for. So going from seven uh, in the you know 2010 framework uh, to over uh, over 100 uh, less than uh, 10 years later, and it goes far beyond this really. Uh, not only is, does the thyroseq uh, version three test look at 112 genes. Uh, there's the potential for identifying uh, greater than 12,000 different point mutations, insertions, or deletions, uh, over 120 gene fusions. And it also looks at uh, gene expression alterations in 19 genes, as well as copy number alterations uh, in 10 regions of the genome. Uh, this graphic is taken from the, the uh, ThyroSeq promotional materials, uh, and you can see uh, how uh, the uh, thyroseq uh, uh, test uh, stratifies risk uh, according to the results that are identified. Uh, uh, first of all, the thyroseq test uh, will classify lesions uh, and separate out those lesions that represent medullary thyroid carcinomas. It has a classifier to look for the, the presence of parathyroid lesions as well as non-follicular uh, uh, thyroid uh, cell uh, derived lesions as well. Once those have been teased out, uh, then the uh, categories uh, are reported as you can see here. Uh, note that the negative uh, uh, thyroseq result in which no alterations are, are detected uh, has a very low probability of either cancer or of a NIFP. And remember, NIFP is a surgical disease uh, so we treat that as basically a true positive result in this context. Uh, so, the, so a negative thyroseq test is going to have a risk of malignancy that's going to very closely approximate a benign result uh, on, F on FNA, and those patients can be safely followed uh, with, without uh, for further uh, surgical intervention. At the other extreme, uh, we can identify high-risk mutations such as a, a BRAF in conjunction with a, a TERT mutation. And those patients might go you know, straight to a total thyroidectomy, potentially uh, with a lymph node dissection. Uh, similarly, high risk of malignancy uh, would be things like BRAF uh, or, or a BRAF-like mutation. Uh, and those patients will clearly go to surgery. Then there are those RAS-like mutations uh, where the most patients are going to go for a diagnostic lobectomy uh, as an alternative. Uh, when we think about these low-risk indeterminate uh, categories, uh, the, the thing we're really hoping for is a test that has a high negative predictive value. Uh, 
uh, because what we're trying to do is identify those patients who, when they have a negative result, can be spared from undergoing surgery. Uh, to have a high negative predictive value, we want these categories to have low disease prevalence, uh, which uh, the Bethesda three and four categories do fit that bill overall. Uh, the ThyroSeq test uh, has a rationale that's more of a rule-in type of test. It's designed to predict malignancy. Uh, so for the ThyroSeq test to, to be effective in terms of having a high, uh, a high negative predictive value, uh, we want that test to really capture all of the common uh, genetic alterations that is, have very few false negatives. And as you can see, as the test has evolved, it has gotten to the point where uh, that is certainly true uh, uh, about the ThyroSeq test. Uh, the Affirma test, which is the next one that I'm going to discuss in detail, uh, is, uh, in contrast, a, a rule-out test. Uh, it's designed uh, by its very nature, uh, as, orig as originally designed, uh, to identify benign thyroid nodules. And therefore, uh, when it first became commercially available, uh, it starts from a perspective of having a, a high negative predictive value. The first iteration uh, of the, the Affirma test uh, had a multi-institutional uh, 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 clinical study that was published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012. Uh, the Affirma uh, test was first the, the GEC, or the Gene Expression Classifier, uh, which looked at 142 genes to establish a benign fingerprint, if you will, of what a benign thyroid nodule looks like. Uh, and if there's a benign uh, Affirma result, uh, that is fitting that profile, uh, then the negative predictive value uh, is, is very high in the 95% range uh, for Bethesda 3 and 4 uh, aspirates uh, overall. The alternative to a benign result with the uh, Affirma test is a so-called suspicious result, which really just means that it's non-clearly benign. Uh, and so that's the alternative. Uh, the negative predictive value for the suspicious for malignancy uh, category was also uh, studied in this multi-institutional uh, trial, and the overall negative predictive value there was found to be 85%, uh, which was considered to be too low uh, for clinical use. Also want to point out that overall in this uh, clinical trial, uh, the benign call rate, that is the percentage of patients who undergo the Affirma test, uh, who can expect to have a benign result uh, was about 40%. One shortcoming of the initial version uh, of the Affirma test uh, is in the uh, group of Herthel cell lesions. And these have been problematic historically, not just for the Affirma test, but for all of the commercially uh, available tests. Uh, and that situation has, again, changed and dramatically improved over time. Uh, but going back to the initial version of the Affirma test, uh, the GEC, uh, you can see here when we compare Herthel cell lesions uh, to non-Herthel cell lesions, uh, that the Herthel cell lesions uh, had a very low benign call rate in the initial uh, version of uh, the Affirma test. That's in contrast to non-Herthel cell lesions, where about half in this uh, pooled data set uh, were, had a benign call rate. And while those patients from the non-Herthel cell group, when they went on to surgery, about half of them had a malignancy. From the Herthel cell group, those that, that had a suspicious uh, call uh, with the Affirma test, only 19% of those patients uh, had a malignancy detected. Uh, so the, the, the Affirma test really did not perform well uh, in its initial uh, iteration uh, for Herthel cell uh, lesions. But as I alluded to briefly already, uh, that situation has changed dramatically, and that's changed in large part because our understanding of the underlying uh, mutational landscape of Herthel cell carcinomas has changed dramatically over time as well. Uh, largely in part from these uh, two papers uh, that were published uh, simultaneously a couple of years ago. Uh, these looked at uh, whole exome sequencing and mitochondrial DNA analysis in large numbers of Herthel cell carcinomas. Uh, 
and found remarkably similar results where you can see uh, that Herzl cell carcinomas are characterized uh, by uh, significant uh, genomic alterations. Uh, so large percentages of Herzl cell carcinomas have things like a near haploid genome or genome-wide uh, duplications or uh, uh, specific chromosomal uh, duplications being identified. Mitochondrial DNA mutations are also highly prevalent in Herzl cell uh, carcinomas. TERP promoter mutations, which again I've already mentioned, are not specific to any particular type of thyroid carcinoma, uh, are present in a significant subset of Herzl cell carcinomas as well. Overall, Herzl cell carcinomas uh, from these two studies could be seen to have a complex variety uh, of other mutations. Over 4,000 somatic mutations uh, were identified in, in one, of, one of the studies, and there is even some overlap uh, with some of the mutations that we see in follicular thyroid carcinomas as well as papillary uh, carcinomas. So it's a very complex landscape, but there are uh, certain alterations that are more characteristic of Herzl cell carcinomas. This information was leveraged uh, in the uh, most recent update to the Affirma uh, test. It's now moved from one platform, that is the gene expression classifier, which was a, a DNA microarray test looking at 142 genes, uh, to the gene sequencing classifier, that is the GSC, uh, which is a high th throughput uh, RNA sequencing test. Uh, that looks at over a thousand core genes and over 10,000 genes overall. The Affirma test, uh, similar to the thyroseq test, has uh, classifiers that can identify medullary carcinomas and parathyroid lesions up front. Uh, the Affirma test now routinely also looks at uh, BRAF B600E mutations uh, as well as uh, PTC gene rearrangement. In addition to the core Affirma test, uh, there's a supplementary optional test, the expression, uh, the Affirma expression atlas, uh, which includes analysis of 593 genes, looking at 905 variants, as well as 235 gene fusion. And this test can be thought of as being more comparable and scoped uh, to the thyroseq test. Uh, going back to the issue of the Affirma test and its performance with Herzl cell lesions, uh, the GSC, that is the more recent version uh, of the Affirma test, also adds two dedicated classifiers to look at Herzl cell lesions. These dedicated classifiers look at uh, loss of heterozygosity as well as mitochondrial uh, transcription. Uh, and they showed, uh, and the GSC compared to the GEC now shows uh, a significant uh, improvement in performance. Uh, for Herzl cell lesions, you can see the specificity going from 12% uh, to 59% in the validation study uh, uh, with, when specifically looking at Herzl cell lesions. Uh, here's a study uh, uh, not included. In it. This is not part of the validation study, but this is a single institution's uh, experience looking at the benign call rate. Uh, of uh, Herzl cell lesions uh, using both the, the earlier version of the Affirma test, the GEC, and the later version, uh, the, the, the genomic sequencing classifier. Uh, and here, these are Bethesda three aspirates that are Herzl cell rich, and then these are Bethesda four aspirates that are suspicious for Herzl cell neoplasm. Uh, and you can see that the benign call rate uh, in the Bethesda three Herzl cell nodules went up all the way to 100%, uh, and the benign call rate in the Bethesda 4 aspirates uh, also went up significantly to the point where the majority of those lesions uh, were being called benign uh, as well. So significant improvement uh, in the Affirma test with the updated version of the test. Similarly, looking at the thyroseq test in its most recent version, uh, this is a, uh, a publication uh, with histopathologic follow-up, looking at Herzl cell uh, rich lesions, uh, so Herzl cell uh, hyperplasias, those are not even neoplastic Herzl cell lesions. All of those were correctly identified as being negative by thyroseq, whereas at the other end of the spectrum, 
uh, the Herthel cell carcinomas were all recognized as being positive using the thyroseq test. And then the Herthel cell adenomas uh, fell somewhere in between with a uh, slight majority of those uh, nodules uh, yielding a positive uh, result with the thyroseq test. So again, um, markedly improvement, uh, markedly improved performance with regard to Herthel cell lesions. Let's talk uh, a little bit about the, the third uh, uh, reasonably popular uh, uh, a commercially available test uh, uh, for uh, molecular analysis of the determinant thyroid FNAs. Uh, that's the Thygenx uh, and Thyromere test. Uh, these, are, these are two tests that can be used in conjunction with one another. Uh, the Thygenx test uh, is a uh, more limited uh, mutational test uh, looking at 10 genes and 28 gene fusions, encompassing the most common mutations that, that we see in thyroid uh, cancers. This test can be used alone or in conjunction with the thyromere test. So that can be an, an add-on reflex test uh, for, uh, as, for aspirates or, or, or specimens that have uh, already undergone the thygenic. Uh, the thyromere test is, uh, does expression analysis of 10 microRNAs. Uh, so that would be used in cases uh, that have undergone Thygenx testing where no mutations are detected or uh, Thygenx uh, has yielded a mutation that's not definitive for malignancy, such as a RAS point mutation. Used in conjunction, uh, the uh, the Thygenx and Thyromere tests yield one of three results, uh, a negative result, uh, a positive result, in which there's something like, say, a BRAF E600E, or a result indicating a moderate risk uh, and, and, uh, of malignancy. And again, uh, as we are now seeing with the other tests, uh, there's a high negative predictive value uh, associated with uh, this test. Here the, so here's a comparison of the validation studies of these uh, three commercially available tests. And, and you can see uh, now that you know, the negative predictive value uh, for all three of these tests is, is, is really quite good. These tests perform very well overall now, much, much better than their uh, initial iteration did. Uh, and, and basically a negative result from any one of these three tests it's going to give you a risk of malignancy that's in the range of what we would expect from a benign thyroid aspirate. Similarly, if we look at the benign call rate, uh, all of these tests are going to be in the range of uh, roughly around half of the test, uh, yielding a benign result uh, so that those patients uh, can be triaged uh, to observation and not uh, undergo a surgical resection for ultimate diagnosis. Uh, this is just a, uh, a real-world uh, comparison uh, from one laboratory, one institution, that is UCLA, where I'm, where I'm at, although I wasn't uh, involved in this particular study. Uh, we actually go back and forth between doing uh, the Affirma, the most recent version of the Affirma test, uh, and the Thyroseq test. Uh, and here you can see uh, that you know, these cases randomized to one or the other of these tests we see very similar performance uh, of the test uh, and very similar, uh, very good performances uh, of both of these tests. Uh, so, so, so these molecular tests have really come uh, a long way. Uh, let's re return to the question about uh, uh, what about prognosis uh, and how can our understanding of the underlying um, molecular alterations uh, impact our, our, our thinking about prognosis and, and, and treatment in that regard. Uh, <clears throat> so clearly, as, as I hope I've made uh, uh, apparent to you, uh, mutations very, very strongly uh, correlate uh, with the ultimate diagnosis, uh, but that is going to de be dependent to a significant degree about what the mutations are uh, that are detected. Uh, so again, BRAF E600E mutations and BRAF uh, related mutations uh, are largely going to be associated with uh, classic type PTCs or tall cell variants of PT PTC, uh, while the RAS point mutations are going to have a much uh, broader array of lesions associated with them. You may, may see them in association with Herthel cell carcinomas, but more frequently we're going to see them 
in follicular adenomas, follicular carcinomas, uh, and, and FPs. And remember, again, those TERT mutations, as well as things like TP53 mutations, those are going to be associated with more aggressive uh, malignancies uh, right out, you know, right, right from the get-go, things like poorly differentiated carcinomas and anaplastic carcinomas. And particularly when we see uh, these high-risk mutations in conjunction with other driver mutations, that's going to be uh, an indicator of a very high-risk uh, uh, lesional status. So how do genetic mutations affect treatment? Uh, we've you know, discussed uh, very extensively how uh, in the FNA setting, uh, particularly with low-risk indeterminate lesions, uh, we can use, uh, we can leverage our understanding of uh, underlying genetic alterations to decide which patients need surgery and which ones can be spared surgery. Uh, in a select subset of patients who've undergone FNA, uh, perhaps some of those Bethesda 5 and 6 patients, we may use uh, uh, genetic mutational testing uh, to, to triage patients in terms of what uh, extent of treatment they, re they may receive. Uh, and and, and that's where I think we can even begin to start thinking about, uh, you know, uh, leveraging these tests more uh, in patients who have localized disease and maybe stratifying them at that initial stage of treatment and thinking about, uh, you know, uh, more personalized treatment on that basis. So, for example, you could, if you had, uh, you know, uh, identical patients who had uh, limited, you know, small, uh, limited no nodules that were limited to the thyroid with no evidence uh, of uh, distant spread, no evidence of lymph node metastases. Uh, you may decide that if one of those patients uh, has a low risk uh, mutation uh, associated with it, uh, a low risk uh, papillary carcinoma mutation associated. Uh, that you may send that patient uh, to just have a lobectomy, for example. Whereas uh, maybe somebody uh, who has an otherwise uh, identical clinical presentation, uh, but has a BRAF E600E mutation in conjunction with a TERT promoter mutation, that that patient would then get, say, a total thyroidectomy, perhaps with a lymph node dissection and subsequent radioactive iodine treatment. Uh, you know, this is an area where I think we start getting into uh, more of the cutting edge, uh, more of the sophisticated uh, clinical thought processes, uh, and, and I would hope that this is, uh, would be fodder uh, for our endocrinologists and, and oncologists to uh, talk about this uh, uh, kind of process and where we are uh, more in, in more detail in, in, a, in a subsequent talk. Uh, similarly, I think uh, it, it, you know, thinking about advanced disease and how we leverage uh, these mutations in that setting uh, with all of the new developments in targeted therapies, probably a topic uh, more for uh, a, another day, but just briefly to give you, uh, you know, an overlook uh, at it. Uh, again, this is taken from, from a ThyroSeq uh, promotional uh, materials uh, where you can see that there are, you know, an increasing array of genes uh, for which targeted therapies are potentially available uh, so that when we have a patient who has advanced thyroid uh, cancer, uh, knowing what the underlying genetic, uh, genomic alteration uh, in those patients uh, is, uh, again, in conjunction with knowing what their cancer type is as well, uh, can lead to the use of uh, different uh, FDA-approved uh, drugs or uh, other drugs that might be used in a, the clinical trial setting. And certainly, uh, in, in our uh, routine uh, clinical practices, uh, as a pathologist, on, on a much more routine basis now, when we see patients uh, with advanced uh, thyroid cancer that's uh, refractory to uh, more conventional treatments, uh, we are routinely being called upon uh, to do molec such molecular testing uh, to identify what the, the genomic alterations are uh, in those patients. So in conclusion, uh, I hope I've uh, uh, given you uh, an appreciation of the tremendous advances uh, 
uh, in our understanding of the genetic alterations uh, that, that drive thyroid cancer uh, uh, have been in the last, you know, say 10 to 15 years. Uh, re you know, re really uh, fantastic progress has, has been made in that regard. Uh, this is largely reflected uh, in improved molecular testing uh, that's now available to us uh, to look at indeterminate uh, thyroid FNAs and potentially spare a significant number of patients from uh, undergoing uh, unnecessary surgery. Uh, and again, we're you know, really reaching that point, the kind of cutting edge, uh, where we can really start to think about uh, using mutational uh, analysis uh, as uh, in, in conjunction with personalized medicine for patients uh, who have advanced disease, uh, but also uh, for uh, risk stratifying patients uh, based on uh, their mutational landscape and uh, beginning to, to use that uh, to drive uh, treatment decisions. Uh, and I think that's where we're going to see uh, a lot of uh, exciting developments in the not uh, very distant future. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll close and I'd be uh, delighted to take uh, any questions that, that you might have. Thank you very much. Jeff, that was an awesome uh, lecture. I truly appreciate it and appreciate even more that you are up so early on the West Coast to join us. So, um, so thank you. Um, I, I encourage uh, folks to send in uh, their questions. This is a unique opportunity to get all of your um, more basic questions answered by um, an expert in the field. Um, so, Jeff, let me ask you a couple of basic questions that have come in here related to um, um, the differences here. How do we interpret um, gene expression alterations Fusion, um, fusions, loss of heterozygosity. Where, what do, what does the clinician uh, do with those, um, those, that, those uh, um, interpretations here? Yeah, it, it's it's actually not, you know, not such a simple question. Um, you, you know, uh, to some extent, these are uh, determined by the the frequencies with which these. Uh, uh, mutations are identified. I, I don't actually pretend to be a, a molecular uh, pathologist, uh, and uh, so I, so I think uh, you know there's a lot of analysis that goes into interpreting these uh, tests. You know within the within the laboratory, so uh, low low frequency abnormalities, particularly those that might not be uh, well characterized in any of the uh, known driver mutations, don't necessarily uh, carry the the same sort of uh, import uh, as some of the other uh, mutations do. Uh, even when we see uh, mutations that that uh, are highly associated uh, as driver mutations, depending on the frequency that they're seen with uh, in the specimen, that that can determine the interpretation. So I, I think ultimately we kind of have to uh, fall back on uh, what the what the test interpretation is uh, that 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 that's handed. Uh, to you, uh, obviously certain class, uh, classes of mutations, so things like loss of uh, heterozygosity are things that we tend to worry about um, more with more with the Herthel cell mutations. Uh, when we see these mutations in, in conjunction with one another, multiple mutations, uh, those are things that sometimes will portend uh, higher risk. Uh, but you know, in in the abstract, any any of these, you know, the, the mutational, as I tried to convey, you know, the the landscape of these is ultimately very, very complex. Uh, although there are certain mutations that show up with, uh, you know, much greater frequency and are much greater predictability, but there's still uh, a lot of uh, unknown mutations out there, or 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 alterations that we can see where we still don't necessarily know what the full clinical significance might be. Great. Okay. Um, terrific. So one of our our um, attendees has asked the question, so what's the bottom line on a suspicious interpretation from a firma? Does that patient need to go to the operating room for a definitive diagnosis, or do you do, an, do, you do any other um, tests in order to make that determination? You know, I, th I, I think it's always important that, that the, these findings always have to be put in conjunction with 
you know, what, what's going on clinically, what's going on uh, in, term, in terms of imaging, uh, and, and you have to, you have to, you know, what's the patient's tolerance, uh, for risk. Uh, so I, I don't necessarily think that, that, uh, that an affirma suspicious result need, needs to have surgery. Uh, you know, as, as some of the data show, I, I showed you indicates, you know, probably the <clears throat> overall risk of malignancy or a NIFT-P, uh, is going to be about 50%, uh, in, in that circumstance. Uh, one of the papers that I uh, provided, you know, was really, uh, you know, much much less uh, in favor of molecular testing and much more about putting everything into the total clinical context of of the patient. Uh, and I and I think that is worth uh, worthwhile to consider that, uh, you know, in many circumstances, you're in probably most circumstances, you're still dealing with if it's a Bethesda 3 or Bethesda 4 nodule, a, a, a nodule that's relatively low risk overall. Uh, so, you know, continuing to observe patients is is an option, uh, but, you know, these are, again, uh, I, don't, I don't think there's a black or, black or white answer there. It's a, it's a discussion that needs to uh, be had between the patient and the surgeon, and they really need to uh, assess everybody's tolerance for risk in that situation. So towards that end, um, the paper that you did send out from Luke Morris, one of the two, which I um, appreciate your forwarding those to us, really does downplay um, the importance of molecular testing from the point of view of um, the, that uh, the risk of a lethal cancer is so low. And um, yet it seems to me that the, um, the, the cat's already out of the bag here and the need to know um, from a patient's perspective will um, will push towards this um, probably knee-jerk reaction of virtually every indeterminate nodule um, being uh, sent for um, molecular testing. Do you find that to be the case in your practice? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's an I think it's an interesting perspective. Um, I think in some ways. Uh, that that manuscript. I, I mean, it, you know, it's um, some of the negatives that are in there are are based on earlier versions of the molecular test. So they 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 certainly have improved in the, in their mo most in uh, most recent versions. But uh, I you know I think patients who are already who've already come to clinical attention, who've already had a nodule that's been imaged and FNA'd, uh, the level of concern there uh both on you know the clinician's part and the patient's part is probably is already at a heightened level and i think i think as you didn't as you indicated there's going to be a push in that situation generally for uh some sort of more uh definitive resolution to 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 what's going on with that particular nodule uh so certainly in our practice uh I wouldn't say it's 100% re reflex testing in Bethesda three, four nodules, but it's pretty darn close. Great. Um, so one of the things that I, I noticed you did not talk about was the importance of the prevalence of um, thyroid cancer in an institution and how that, um, what role that plays in interpretation of the molecular results. Um, can you touch on that and um, how should the clinician factor that into um, everyday practice? Yeah, that's that's uh, certainly uh, a, a, a very important factor. Uh, just in, in the interest of time, I didn't uh, didn't really get into that, but uh, but that's absolutely true. Uh, if we are talking about you know negative predictive values, negative predictive value uh, is going to be you know very very uh, very dependent on what the prevalence of disease is uh, within your Bethesda uh, three four nodule. So if if you have a laboratory uh, that's you know got a, you know very very low prevalence of of uh, cancer within uh, those categories. Uh, then 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 the negative then those tests are going to perform very well in that setting. Uh, if if you have a, a laboratory uh, where there's a much higher prevalence of disease, then then the tests aren't going to perform as well. So uh, I, I think it's just uh, important wherever possible. Uh, you you want to know what the performance of your individual laboratory is, uh, 
this is why uh, the, the the Verisite folks have have pushed for, uh, particularly when the test first came out, they really pushed for central testing uh, because there there was a a known quantity in terms of of the risk, uh, but in many instances that's not practical and people still rely on their their local uh, laboratories. I don't want to be put out of business either. Uh, so. Uh, so I, th I think it's just important to to try to you know communicate with your lab director, and if they have that information, you 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 really want to want to want to know that. Great. So one of our um, uh, attendees has asked the question whether in specifically in cystic lesions, um, is there any role for molecular diagnosis? Diagnosis, um, and the follow-on question related to. Um, whether or not molecular testing of lymph node aspirates um, would, should be done uh, to inform uh, surgical decision making. Uh, so, uh, with with regard to lymph nodes, you know, I don't, I don't think, uh, I, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it routinely. Uh, you know, I, I, I think the problem you kind of start to talk, and and probably cysts are are, are uh, and the. Uh, Cystic lesions probably start to pose the 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 similar opposite question, which is, you know, that the 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 positive predictive value of the of the scenario going in starts to matter. And then, you know, what happens if you have a non-diagnostic uh, test, you know, a non-diagnostic interpretation uh, from your cytopathologist, and yet you have a, a positive molecular test, and you can get false positive results uh, as well. Uh, when you have uh, circumstances where there's very low prevalence of, of disease, uh, so I, I wouldn't, I, I don't think we should encourage that on a routine basis. Uh, it it can put you in kind of difficult situations uh, where you kind of don't know what to do with the information uh, that 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 you're given, and probably just leads to to more more testing, uh, repeat repeat biopsies, uh, and that's. You know, again, I think ultimately you have to put you know your pathology findings, your molecular findings into context with what your clinic level of clinical suspicion is. If you get a negative uh, result from your pathologist, uh, then you're probably going to have to chase chase that down uh, clinically. And I don't think that necessarily having another piece of data from from the molecular is going to be determinative in that circumstance either. Great. Um, one of our uh, questions coming in is uh, related to differences in the pathophysiology between herthal cell adenomas and herthal cell um, carcinomas, particularly with respect to uh, genetic drivers. Yeah, I don't think that the herthal cell adenomas have been uh, characterized to, to the to the same extent uh, as as the carcinomas, understandably. Uh, so I I. I I think that still uh, remains to to uh, a large extent a a a, uh, a bit of a gray, a gray area in terms that we, that we can't uh, say definitively certainly uh, based on molecular testing alone uh, whether we're going to be dealing with an adenoma or a carcinoma. Ult ultimately, for for all for all of these, uh, with very few exceptions like like the BRAF B600E uh, mutation, uh, you're going to need the pathologist to ultimately tell you what's what's going on. Uh, the molecular uh, isn't to the point yet where we can say uh, that the, this result is is going is definitely going to be X result. So a follow-on question related to herthal cell lesions um, is whether you're surprised that the results coming out of thyroseq differ. Um, uh, uh, between benign and malignant herthal cell neoplasms, whether there are differences in genes not tested by thyroseq, such as mitochondrial DNA, um, uh, as a, uh, a potential uh, marker here. Yeah, I think it's probably going to be, you know, an, an, an issue of uh, frequency. Uh, you know, the, you know, as as we're seeing with, you know, things like you know BRAF with with TERT. Uh, you know, when we're talking about the lesions that 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 are real that really have true potential for aggressive behavior, uh, we're not usually talking about isolated mutations. We're usually talking uh, about multiple hits that are present in those lesions. So I don't think it's uh, terribly surprising uh, that 
that the Herthel cell adenomas versus the Herthel cell carcinomas, that the carcinomas are going to have a more uh, complex underlying uh, genetic profile in those circumstances. And therefore, you know, in a test like the thyroseq test, uh, more consistently give you a positive result while, while the Herthel cell adenomas are going to be a little bit more of a mixed picture. Great. So in the final 60 seconds here, Jeff, um, as one of the newscasters on the nightly news says, the race to the finish at the very end of their newscast, tell me what you anticipate um, diagnostic, diagnosis of uh, thyroid nodules will look like from a um, combination cytopathology molecular um, diagnostics in five years and in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> you got five, you got, I've, I've used up uh, half of the 60 seconds here. Yeah, yeah, you, <laughs> you did. Uh, well, 10 years is probably, you know, a bit, you know, a bit beyond my pay grade. But, uh, you know, I, th I, I think, you know, what we're certainly going to expect to see uh, in, in the next several years is uh, I, I think that uh, we're going to see potentially uh, again, more personalized approaches to whether patients have surgery or, or not. Uh, what the extent of surgery might be, and I think we might might see uh, additional testing, uh, you know, preoperatively in lesions that are called suspicious for malignancy uh, or or malignant, uh, as as we really try to you know kind of re refine our di I diagnoses more. Uh, you know, hopefully, you know, ten years, maybe we do get to that point where there are uh, more. Uh, as our understanding goes, uh, it gets better of the underlying mutations. Maybe we do get uh, to a point where there are more entities where uh, just based purely on the molecular profile, we might know uh, what entity uh, we're, we're dealing with before we even get to uh, the operative stage. Uh, I think that, that I, I don't think you're going to get that, those answers in every circumstance, but maybe in more circumstances than we have today. Terrific. Hey, Jeff, thank you very much. This has been awesome. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your getting up as early as you have uh, to join us and hope that everybody uh, has a great a great weekend. And um, I'm starting to get to the point where I don't have to say uh, stay safe, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, hope that you'll join us next week. And, um, and, and uh, once again, thank you for being a part of our virtual program. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Good morning, all.